I'm going to tell you the story of a blanket. And in doing so, I'm going to tell you the story of Canada. This blanket is probably one of the best known Canadian signifiers next to, say, the Canadian flag. It's a creamy white colored wool with four stripes, green, red, yellow, and indigo. It was created in the 1700s, and today that same design is now on bags, hats, jackets, you name it. There's a pretty good chance that if you live in this country, you've seen it on something somewhere. It was this design that was featured on a blanket that the colonist and trader swore could save your life. And it was that same blanket that the indigenous people swore could kill you. This is The Secret Life of Canada, a history podcast about the country you know and the stories you don't. Okay, what do you think of when you think of the bay? Perfume. Huge perfume ground floor in Montreal where I'm from that I'd walk around and like avoiding people trying to give things to me but also trying to smell the things I wanted to smell. That's where we went for lunch on the way home from the YMCA. It's like macaroni salad. Like, ah, there's too much cucumber in this. I think of fur trapping and I think of the blankets, the yeah. stripes, the colors, and the lipstick counter lady. Old people? <laughs> And also the the pattern, like the blanket and coats, whatever. Right. Yeah. Hey, Fallon. Hey, Leah. Okay, we are back. We are. And in a place that is 300% nicer than where we were last year. I know. For listeners that may not know us, the first season of Secret Life of Canada was recorded in a blanket fort in my apartment. So the CBC is a slight step above our last setup. This is true. We started the podcast last year as two curious people. I'm Mohawk and Tuscarora from Six Nations. And I'm a first generation black Canadian. And in the past episodes of the show, we have focused on the history of a place. But for this episode, I decided to focus on a blanket. Are you trying to audition for the Antiques Roadshow? Is it a quilt? No. I love quilts. No. <laughs> Although, if they called, I would go immediately. That show is amazing. It's a gem. I agree. No, today I want to look at the Hudson's Bay Point Blanket, which is iconic. The blanket and its famous stripes are everywhere, right? Like, they're at events. You see it at, like, fundraisers. They're at the Olympics. I even saw them on the red carpet at TIFF. Famous people were standing on them in posing. So it's really interesting because a lot of people who have one at home right now might not know it comes with a very complicated, contentious, and disputed backstory, much like the history of Canada. There are two sides to it. Right. Some say that the blanket helped settlers to survive when they arrived in the country. Others say indigenous people say that the blanket helped to devastate entire nations by carrying disease. See, that's really interesting because I had no clue that for years some people were calling the Bay Blanket the plague blanket. I just thought, actually, I confess I never thought about it. I mean, I have things to do. I don't think about Right, who has the time? The history of the blanket. But here we are. Here we are now. <laughs> yes, here we are. And I have to say that although I know that the blanket represents smallpox to me and other Indigenous people, I don't know when that association started. So to tell you about the blanket, we have to begin with a bit about the bay. Today, they want to be known as HBC. They're doing kind of a KFC thing, like, don't call us Kentucky Fried Chicken. We are the cooler, less evocative KFC. <laughs> right. But HBC actually just stands for the Hudson's Bay Company. Yeah. Think of the Hudson's Bay Company as being the grandparent of HBC. And just like human grandparents, department store grandparents are sometimes offensive and inappropriate. It's true. You love them, but you also have to keep explaining to them that no one uses the term broad anymore to describe a woman. The Hudson's Bay Company is so old and has such a storied past in the development of Canada, their archives contain 3,000 linear meters of records. So in layman's terms, enormous. And with all of these records, you can see why the Hudson's Bay Company sort of gets to be its own master of its history, because they have so many written records and oral histories aren't written down mm -hmm. and compiled in that same way. That's right. And oral history is indigenous history, really. Mm -hmm. So while the company's trading posts were a lifeline to many early settlers and colonists in this country, the company's arrival changed things drastically for the indigenous people. Because the arrival of the Hudson's Bay Company can be considered the seeds of colonialism. By the way, colonialism is defined as the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control 
control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. Just a fun FYI for your day. Correct. Gold star for you. A gold star for colonialism. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> I meant for the definition. And yes, from the beginning of the Hudson's Bay Company, they described themselves as a company of adventures. And they're still saying that today. John Ray was a doctor for Hudson's Bay Company. He led four Arctic expeditions back in the 1840s and 50s. He learned from the Inuit, and it was Ray who found the last missing link of the fabled Northwest Passage. Just goes to show, survival skills can take you a long way. We are a country of adventurers. So that's the narrative. So that is the narrative, and it's still going on. That was Les Stroud, who's the you survivor, know, survivor man, man who survivor I love. Man. I love Survivor Man. I love man. it. Beautifully put together. But you can see its iconography, both then and now, is still about survival, beating the elements, conquering the Canadian wild, and cutting a new path. Or claiming one that was already there. Okay, but how did a company that's so old become so linked to the foundations and the identity of Canada? Okay, so the beginning of all of this was in 1610. A man by the name of Henry Hudson set sail from London with a crew of 22 people, including his son, John. They entered what is now called the Hudson Strait. Obviously, it wasn't when they entered it, but just south of Baffin Island and then sailed into Hudson's Bay, which they thought was the Pacific Ocean. By the winter, the conditions became terrible, and everyone almost froze to death or got scurvy. The men ended up eating frogs and moss and hating Captain Hudson. It got so bad that the crew threw Henry, his son, and some faithful crew members into a small boat and pushed them out onto the water. They were never seen again. <laughs> oh my Wait, what? this is the beginning of the I know, story. I know. It's like, man, if you don't like your boss, just quit. Pushing them out to sea in the middle of winter to die does seem extreme. That being said, when your checks are never on time and you have to stay late and you eat moss every night, it like it can add up. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> Henry Hudson seems like he was the original Michael Scott from The Office and the crew was Stanley. And Angela, I would add. But by the 1650s, two French traders named Chouard and De Grossier noticed that the water of the Hudson's Bay would be a faster and safer sea passage. The Wendat, the indigenous people of that region, had shown them an area that had a massive amount of beaver and other animals just dying to get turned into hats and coats. So so they decided the Hudson's Bay would be a great area to claim as a trading post. Despite the fact that at that time there were thousands of indigenous people already trading with each other. Yeah, I mean, a ton of people were living life and doing fine when Chouard and De Grossier said, you know what this place needs? Us. So they decided that in order to really make a go of building a trading company, they needed to head back to France and get their countrymen's support for this venture. So they asked France and France said... Um, not only is it a hard pass, but we're going to fine you. Take all your fur. It's nice, by the way. And you, De Grossier, you're going to jail for having left without permission. And that had to burn. Oh, yeah. So in retaliation, they did the one thing that would enrage France the most. They went to England. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got it. And they asked Prince Rupert, who was the cousin of King Charles II, for help. He said yes, of course, because what could be better than scooping the French? So England sends them back. They touch down in 1668 in a waterway between today's Ontario and Quebec called Winnipeg. After they arrived, they quickly renamed it James Bay. This voyage and these men are recognized as the founding elements of the Hudson's Bay Company. So that would make the Hudson's Bay Company three, carry the one. Yeah, plus, carry the do you need one. A and, yeah, because people do long Let division. Let me get and... you some loose leaf paper <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Can pen. you get me some full scap? <laughs> <laughs> can you get in a time machine and go get me some full scap? Okay, so how old was it? Three hundred forty-eight years. years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> older than Canada, I think. Mm -hmm, older yeah. than Canada. Yeah, that's about your age, right? I think uh, that's about your, yeah, and you're. You carry the and one? you're two years older than me, right? So technically, yeah. I look way better than you. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and this one day will be you're the gonna go final gray. Episode <laughs> of the Secret Life of Canada. So okay, let's get back to okay. the men of the Hudson's Bay. So when they landed, England gave them the ability to trade basically wherever they wanted. 
as long as the territory traversed into the Hudson's Bay. This territory was named Rupert's Land after Prince Rupert. Makes sense. The territory that they claimed was enormous and 15 times the size of Britain, almost 40 percent of what we call Canada today. To give you an idea of how big that is, today's Rupert's Land would be Manitoba, most of Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, southern Nunavut, parts of northern Ontario and Quebec, and some of the U.S. And again, this was already the territory of several First Nations and thousands of people. The Hudson's Bay Charter was granted in 1670. Now, it contained a clause that the Hudson's Bay Company was not allowed to attack the holdings of any other Christian monarchs. So if anybody else who was Christian, like the French or the, right, you know, right. Dutch, maybe? I yeah, don't know. Yeah, they were. Got there. Were no attacks. There. No attacks. But it said almost nothing about the rights and holdings of the nations who had been living on the land for thousands of years. This charter is interesting, but it was not as good as Crazy Rich Asians, which is also what I was reading when I was doing this research. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. I'm just going to admit that. Yeah. I, <laughs> does it does it play into uh, your learning of the Hudson's I mean, Hudson's it did. It helped me, but it didn't have as many plot twists. I felt like if the charter had included a lavish wedding or perhaps any Asian people at all, I would have given it a better rating on Amazon. Hmm. Okay, well, let's get back to another huge faceless corporation. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) And back to the charter. Yeah. So it gave the Hudson's Bay Company the right to exploit mineral resources, which would become incredibly important because by 1960, they had become the sixth largest Canadian oil producer. I mean, it's kind of stunning because you you realize it's way more than the department store you go to buy a tuna fish sandwich from while also looking for leggings. That's gross. (laughs) What? (laughs) I don't know. I just think eating a tuna fish sandwich while shopping for pants is disgusting. (laughs) It's protein and coverage all at the same time. They're two things that we need in society, protein and pants. I think eating while shopping is worse than eating on like a bus. (laughs) I disagree. You're not in an enclosed. I mean, you're in a. Anyway, back to the charter. Yes, Let's get back to the charter. All right. The charter also included the obligation to search for the Northwest Passage, which everyone was obsessed with at that time. You can hear a little bit about that in our North episode from season one. So it was this territory that the Hudson's Bay Company would have a monopoly over for the next 200 years. Yeah, it's why to this day, the Bay has the power to convince Mariah Carey to lip sync All I Want for Christmas in the front of their Queen Street storefront in Toronto. They paid her a million dollars bucks to do Did that. Did you see that? Oh, Did I you, wa- go, you went? No, I watched it on YouTube. It's oh. real. Everybody, you can go to your YouTube ah. machines right now and you can watch it. Did okay, you I'll watch right her back. reality show, Mariah's World? No, I did not. Oh, it was amazing. She wore satin corsets the whole time and pretended to just casually be walking about the place in corsets. I loved it. <laughs> I don't know who you are, but I'll probably what? watch it too. <laughs> don't judge me. You watch Florabama Shore. Not even Jersey Shore. <laughs> Florabama Shore. It's so embarrassing. Well, it's all out there. Well, in a way, this is the earliest Jersey Shore. This is the earliest (laughs) Shore show. (laughs) Hudson Shore. (laughs) Colonial Shore. Yes. Eight fur traders are live streamed 24-7 in a frozen tent. Colonial Shore, where the furs are real and the scurvy will kill you. All of that aside, the Hudson's Bay beginnings are aligned with an industry that drastically altered indigenous life, traditions, and wildlife in this country. In Europe, the demand for beaver went through the roof because the fur was waterproof and because there was a fashion craze. Hats. Yeah. There were estimated approximately 6 million beavers at the beginning of the fur trade. By the late 19th century, the beaver was close to extinction. It's why they are the symbol of Canada. It was their fur in a way that started the economy. I'm sure beavers find a lot of comfort in that fact. I know. So we've covered a bit about the history and the beginnings of the Hudson's Bay, but let's talk about the blanket. Oh, yes. Okay, let's get into it. The blanket has outlasted so many other products that the Bay sold. I mean, 
You can no longer go to the bay for a snappy beaver top hat, shame. but you can still get this blanket. I know it is a shame. In fact, by 1991, the company actually completely stopped selling fur, although they now have an exclusive fur salon where if you have $3,800 lying around, you can get a sheared beaver bay blanket beaver on one side point blanket on the other that sounds very affordable i may just go and get (laughs) myself one right after this (laughs) what's the difference between the bay blanket and the point blanket okay well it's the same thing the point blanket gets its name from a fine line called a point which is woven into the edge of the blanket the blankets were made in england and there could have been one point or several depending on the size of the blanket gotcha so more points means more blanket correct The most commonly known bay blanket is the cream one with the red, the green, the yellow and the indigo bars across it. As the bay got more and more into retail in the 30s, they produced blankets in all kinds of colors and would do different versions of it for special events. In fact, last year for Canada 150, they designed a new one called the Ice Point Blanket, which had a two-toned gray design. Hmm. That's kind of how I felt about Canada 150. (laughs) Great. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Okay, well, right. <laughs> These blankets were a big deal. They were heavy and warm and great at resisting shrinking after getting damp, which was a big deal when you think about the conditions people were sleeping in at the time. It was like camping today, but times a hundred. Yeah, like without a stove and a chilled bottle of wine. Yeah, there was no backup generator for your laptop so you could binge watch Netflix. I can't imagine. It was hard times. Hard times. So these blankets were sought after. In fact, by the 1700s, 60% of all goods exchanged in the fur trade were blankets. Both the Europeans and indigenous people valued them because they could be used for everything. People cut them into coats and lining for their boots. They would use them to seal doorways and windows when they didn't have enough wood or glass. People were buried in them, and they were even used as, like, sails for boats. And because of all this, the blanket is held up as a symbol of colonial perseverance and survival. The company writes about the blanket like this. For over two centuries, the Hudson's Bay Point Blanket has been an iconic product in Canada and around the world. It is enjoyed as much today as when it was first introduced into the fur trade in 1780. That voice is terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I never want to meet that person. It's my phone voice (laughs) when I call Bell and I'm like, I need a new cell phone plan and I need it to be cheap. Oh my God. It's scary. It It hasn't worked so far, but they're always like, no. Anyway, (laughs) in fact, when you do a cursory glance at the history, uh, you see the same words come up over and over. Iconic, Canadian, warmth, luxury, and hey, They are all those things. But some Indigenous communities say that the blanket brought smallpox and the disease brought devastation. We spoke to Jim Daszak, the author of Clearing the Plains, Disease, Politics of Starvation, and the Loss of Aboriginal Life. We wanted to hear more about what effect smallpox had on Indigenous communities at this time. Well, smallpox was the most deadly disease in human history. All of our ancestors, those of us who are from Europe, probably had some pockmarks from endemic smallpox. When Europeans came to, to America or where settlers established kind of European economies, those communities had never experienced smallpox. You could easily have 80% of the people dying in the span of probably three or four weeks. And what that means, and especially in the context of, of First Nations people, in America is that it it didn't matter if you were healthy or, I guess, unhealthy, malnourished. Even healthy people who were exposed to smallpox were as susceptible as as others. So in the span of three weeks, you might get 80% of your hunters. You get 80% of the babies and moms. And also because First Nations in North America passed on information and wisdom from elder, you know, from one generation to, to the other, what happened was in the span of three weeks, you might lose 80% of your elders. And what that means is your community loses 80% of its knowledge base, like kind of it's like, you know, having your library destroyed. Those communities were never really the same in the aftermath. 
it was so interesting talking to James and just hearing how fast smallpox would take an entire community. And he told me, I mean, even in Saskatchewan, before it was Saskatchewan, they had all of these different nations and they eventually turned into one nation, the Plains Cree, because so many different communities were decimated. They came together and it's called ethnogenesis. It's so interesting. So, you know, there's an impact even hundreds of years later because people had to reform their society. Right. And we know what happened in places like Saskatchewan because the fur traders kept written records. William Thomason was in charge of the Hudson's Bay Cumberland House. He documented the smallpox epidemic of 1781 and 1782. Here are some of the journal entries kept by Thomason and his staff. December 17th, 1781. I received the disagreeable news of that devouring disorder the smallpox raging amongst the natives and is carrying all off before it. 2nd of July. The whole tribe of Indians are deceased except one young child. The many different tribes are also almost wholly extinct, as I am assured by Mr. Thomason and Longmore, for they say that they really believe of young and old, not one in 50 of those tribes are now living. So it's no wonder that the blankets became synonymous with sickness. They would be stored at the forts, which were the home of the Hudson's Bay traders. You'd go there to pick up things, and days later, your entire community was dying. Now, the Hudson's Bay Company and many historians say that, yes, there was smallpox, but it wasn't in the blankets. Indigenous people did not have the immunity to diseases that the Europeans had. They were trading many things back and forth, and humans contract diseases. It's just what happened. And there's no proof to link the blanket to the spread of disease. But I asked James about why then is this still so talked about? Well, because the Bay aside, since Canada kind of uh, claimed the land out here on the prairies, the, the state's treatment of First Nations people, like really, you know, like that relationship has been so dysfunctional, so negative and so violent that it's not really that much of a stretch for people to believe you know, that they were killed on purpose. Now, James says he doesn't believe it happened, or if it did, it was not purposeful. But we wanted to hear from another historian. So we spoke to Carolyn Prodruchny, an associate professor of history at York University in Toronto, and the author of Making the Voyager World, Travelers and Traders in North American Fur Trade. The disease coming, like all of those microbes, like... That was not intentional because Europeans did not understand it at the time. So it certainly worked for them in the colonization front. Because if you think about all the wars that were happening as European powers, when they settled in the New World and and started to expand and take more Indigenous land, they benefited from the fact that the Indigenous people were undergoing this, you know, horrific trauma of disease. So if you ask the question about why is the rumor so persistent about the smallpox-infested blanket? I think the real answer actually is that the effects of colonialism were so terrible. It could actually have happened. There could have been smallpox transmitted through bay blankets. But I don't think it was intentional because people didn't understand the way disease worked. And it wasn't in the interest of the fur traders to kill off their, their customers, you know. Like they needed the indigenous people in the fur trade. Sending smallpox doesn't make any sense. Um, so it does make sense militarily if you want to defeat your enemy, but they people were trading partners with indigenous people. Okay, yes, there is no proof that it happened at the Bay, but it is on record of happening in Pennsylvania at Fort Pitt, which was not a Bay trading post. So why are we talking about it then? Well, it was the states, but there was no border to the indigenous people at the time. The concept of borders and land ownership is a Western construct. Indigenous nations traveled and journeyed all over this land. This concept of borders, of dividing lines, didn't come up for years. Right. So you had nations who were living on either side of the border. My people exist on both sides of the border. Uh, it just depends where your village was and where your settlement was, where your hunting grounds were. Right. And that's, right. you know, who you ended up siding with. Right. So it's possible that some indigenous people saw or heard this happening, this spreading of disease through blankets in the States before it was the States. And then they made an obvious conclusion. 
everywhere else that people were getting smallpox near trading posts could be getting it from these blankets. Of course. Why wouldn't you come to that conclusion? And maybe they had good reason to be suspicious. Well, right, because in 1763, General Jeffrey Amherst and Colonel Bouquet, who was stationed at Fort Pitt, exchanged letters. Amherst knew smallpox had broken out at the fort. Amherst got word that a trader at the fort had given a Delaware warrior named Turtleheart and Mamo UT, a chief, two blankets, a silk handkerchief, and a piece of cloth that had been in a smallpox hospital. According to inventory accounts, the items were given to the men to, quote, convey smallpox to the Indians. Two weeks later, General Amherst laid out a plan to use the blankets as biological weapons against Indigenous people. Here is some of their correspondence. Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among those disaffected tribes of Indians? We must, on this occasion, use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. I will try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets that may fall in their hands, taking care, however, not to get the disease myself. You will do well to try and inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as try every other method that can serve to extirpate this exorable race. All your directions will be observed. And that concludes Masterpiece Theatre. <laughs> now, this record is not about the Bay. But even the Bay knows that somehow this Fort Pitt history in Pennsylvania and the Hudson's Bay history have become merged and linked. Here's what the Bay has to say about it. This was a Q&A they used to have on their website back in 2015. I heard that the HBC sent blankets infected with smallpox to the First Nations. Is there any truth to this story? No. This is perhaps one of the most widely propagated and misunderstood stories in North American history. Moreover, it has been circulating for a very long time, but it is not true and has nothing to do with HBC or the experience of Aboriginals in Canada. On the contrary, the HBC Point Blanket became a significant item for many First Nation cultures. It continues to enjoy their respect to this day. There is a kernel of truth behind the allegation, but the alleged perpetrator was a British general fighting during the American, French, and Indian War. And yes, General Amherst was British, but he's revered here in Canada like a lot of other British dudes. Yeah, for his efforts in plotting mass genocide through infected blankets, there is an Amherstburg in Ontario and an Amherst in Nova Scotia. But Canada maintains it didn't happen here. So they have nothing on paper, which means that no one can prove that the blankets intentionally carried diseases in Canada. But what I know as many other Indigenous people in this country know, is that that blanket is a symbol. Those stripes mean something. They mean the dispossession of land, which is the lifeblood of our culture. When I see those stripes, I think of that symbol as colonialism. And colonialism was the beginning of the end for many of us. And the way I feel is not new. Lots of Indigenous people for a very long time have felt the same way. Yeah. In fact, a testament to that is the 1972 NFB film called The Other Side of the Ledger, an Indian view of the Hudson's Bay Company. The film looks at Indigenous perspectives towards the Hudson's Bay Company on its 300th anniversary. It was written and directed by members of the historic NFB Indian film crew, an all-Indigenous production unit established in 1968. For many of us, the Hudson's Bay Company is the main bone of contention. We have been conquered as natives, we have been colonized, and we are still under the control of that same company. The only way we'll ever get out of it is through national liberation movement. Therefore, I say in the 300 year, under the festivities and propaganda that's going out, that we should be radicalizing and revolutionize our brothers and sisters so that we will move and mobilize to take over these stores and the companies. Take them over? Of course it means we will have to seize them. We don't expect the Hudson Bay Company to give them to us, that's for sure. But they are our property. We paid for it many times over. And I think it's time that we simply made it our property in a physical sense. 
Now, the reason that we have to do this it's not necessarily that we want to take over the Hudson Bay stores. They're not such great industries for us and won't employ that many people. But the thing is that Hudson Bay personnel are the key people in decision making in our communities, which hold, there's a small white power structure in each of our communities, which holds the power and dominate us. Wow, they did not pull any punches. Oh, no, they did not. And you can see this fire and determination in this new generation of Métis and First Nations activists at this time. This was fascinating to watch, so much so that we will link it so that everyone can see it. Featured prominently in the film is a 31-year-old activist, Duke Redbird, from Saugeen First Nation. In this clip, he talks about the wide misconception that many Canadians held, which was that Indigenous people on reserve were getting huge payments from the Canadian government. In fact, at this time, some nations received only $5 per year per person for land settlements. Now the fact is that treaty Indians live on the reserve, they get all their money every year from the government. Non-treaty Indians live off the reserve, they don't get any money. Now I'll never forgive my grandfather for moving off the reserve because it must be really nice having five bucks a year coming in regularly, eh? Today, Dr. Duke Redbird is 79 and he is an activist, advocate and artist who was recently nominated for a Grammy. He is a speaker and educator on Indigenous arts and culture. I asked him why the film was so important to make on the 300th anniversary of the Hudson's Bay Company. It was very important because as the Hudson Bay Company was being celebrated, what were they celebrating? They were celebrating the wholesale exploitation of Indigenous peoples in the uh, fur trade. The uh, Hudson Bay Company was set up as a cartel. Uh, Instead of dealing with drugs, they were dealing with furs. I asked Elder Duke how he thinks the company has been able to tell the story it wants to tell. The uh, incredible public relations machine that they have going for themselves. I mean, they can spend millions of dollars uh, doing a public relations in their stores and the manner in which they engage the public. They put out this idea that they were uh, a participant in the development of Canada. But it's all lies. I asked Elder Duke about the reaction to the film when it was released. Hudson Bay uh, public relations machine went in went into high gear and uh, made representation to the uh, federal government and the National Film Board to uh, limit its audience. And did that work? It didn't get wide uh, distribution, let's put it that way. I wanted to know if Elder Duke had heard the story of the Bay Blanket being connected to smallpox. General Amherst uh, used the uh, smallpox-infested blankets and wrote a uh, memo to his... uh, uh, subordinates to say distribute them to the indigenous people and and it will uh, eliminate a problem that we have with the indigenous people. So uh, the idea that uh, any blanket was uh, uh, suspect if it was given by anybody and certainly when they found out that the church was actually using blankets out in British Columbia that were smallpox or tuberculosis infested. In other words, they took the blankets off the patients who died and then just uh, handed them over to the new children that that, uh, came in. So it was a Hudson Bay blanket specifically made in order to uh, do biological warfare against the indigenous people? No, the blanket itself was in the beginning a gift, uh, the the gift of a blanket like that, was something that was treasured by the indigenous people because uh, it was a lot lighter to uh, wrap yourself in a blanket than a buffalo robe. So in the beginning, it was fine. But if someone got smallpox or tuberculosis or some other fatal disease, the blankets weren't burned or disinfected. They were just given to the next one that came along. And the church, the Hudson Bay Company, the RCMP all knew that that would happen. They had vaccinations. The fact is that indigenous people are marginalized and have no use whatsoever to the Canadian uh, Confederation. 
I asked him what he thought people should know about the Hudson's Bay Company as it relates to its history. The Hudson Bay Company is no different than any other large conglomerate and corporation who was in collusion with the uh, colonial powers of the, of the day. I mean, uh, it was a Hudson Bay Company in Canada. It was the East India Company in India, the big diamond interest in South Africa. It was all a colonial empire building. I mean, uh, there's no one in Europe that wasn't involved in the exploitation of indigenous peoples around the world. And it's still happening today. It's no different today. It's interesting that Dr. Redbird often used the term marketing machine in reference to the Bay, because while we were recording this, thousands of teachers across Canada received a brand new free book called An Epic Tale. Each one was sent with a letter from the president of the Hudson's Bay Company explaining it as a new history book and teaching tool that will tell the next generation of young Canadians the story of the HBC, North America's oldest company. It's beautiful, glossy, inspiring and nostalgic. And right in the center of it is a two page spread on what it calls its most iconic brand, the Bay Blanket. The Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the New Credit. It's written and hosted by me, Leah Simone Bowen. And me, Phelan Johnson. And produced by Katie Jensen. Our historical consultant is John Weir. And our digital producer is Fabiola Carletti. The senior producer of CBC Podcast is Tanya Springer. And the executive producer is RF Norani. Come hang out with us in our new Facebook group. You can check out a recent Q&A and chat with us about this episode. Tell us what you think. And if you happen to be in Toronto on November November 5th, come check out our first ever live show about the city Canadians love to hate, Toronto. Toronto. We'll be at the Ted Rogers Cinema at 9 p.m. for the Hot Docs Podcast Festival. Tickets are on sale at hotdocsinema.ca. We're also on Instagram and on Twitter at Secret Life of CAD. If there's a story you want to hear in an episode or a piece of history you want to tell us about, email us at secretlifeofcanada at cbc.ca. If you liked what you heard, or even if you didn't, please review us on iTunes. It really helps other people find us. It really does. It really does. Thanks for exploring Canada's hidden history with us, and remember to pass it on. If you like this show, check out Ty Ask Why. He's very adorable little 11-year-old. He's way smarter than we are. Super smart. He's asking life's biggest questions, things that I would still like answered. Listen to Ty. (laughs) Bye, guys.